Dean. Welcome to this candidate forum sponsored by League of Women Voters, Kansas City. Um, we are going to see three candidates tonight for the second legislative district um, primary coming up very soon, August 2nd. I am Tommy Sexton. I am a member of the League. The League of Women Voters is a nonpartisan organization. We neither screen nor endorse candidates. Our mission is to empower voters to defend our democracy, and we envision a democracy where every citizen has the desire, the right, the knowledge, the confidence to participate, and our membership is open to everyone. We are here for this voter education event to provide an opportunity for you to ask questions and listen as the candidates present their positions. Voters have submitted questions via email at forum question at lwbkc.org. If you have last minute questions, please send them in now. All of the candidates running for the second district Jackson County legislature have been invited to participate in our forum tonight. Each term is for four years. There is one candidate tonight running for the second district Jackson County legislature and three candidates running for the second Jackson County legislature at large. Each second district voter is eligible to vote for one candidate for district two and for three candidates or for, who are running for the second district at large. That's correct, you'll have the opportunity to vote for four people. We welcome and appreciate the following three candidates who are with us tonight. Mitchell W. Sudeth for the second district and for the second district at large, Donna Payton and John J. Murphy. I will refer to them this evening by their last names. I'd like for you all to know the other league members volunteering for tonight. Our timekeeper is Elizabeth Dar. Our Zoom board is monitored by Terry Lane. This forum will be recorded and available and archived on the league's webpage, lwvkc.org. The candidates will answer each question in a random order I've already shared with the candidates. Actually, I haven't. We just now redid it. Looks like this. Each will have 90 seconds to respond to questions. Candidates, play, please answer the question asked to respond to questions and, and stick to the topic. There will be no rebuttals, but you can go back to an issue during your closing remarks for which you are allotted two minutes. Okay, let us begin. Okay, one moment. Excuse me for the confusion. We're gonna start first uh, with Ms. Payton. Why are you running for the Jackson County Legislature and what particular experiences or skills have prepared you to serve as a county legislator, including any background with managing money and finance? Thank you. First, let me say thank you to the entire League of Women Voters for putting this forum on. I really appreciate this opportunity to speak directly to your organization and to the voters. I am running because I want to serve. I um, am a single mother, raised by a single mother, was active in my children's lives in school, went to PTA meetings, but I never knew the impact that my voice actually has, nor was I ever officially invited to the table. 
I want to serve because I want to be a voice for our residents. I want to serve our residents with integrity and I want to impact the future of Jackson County. It is my honor to have this opportunity and I do not take any vote for granted, um, nor do I take what I will be as a part of the board for granted. I am here to serve with integrity, honesty, and transparency. Thank, Thank you. you. Mr. Sudeth. Like me to repeat the question? I think you're muted. There we go. Okay. Yeah. No, same here. It's 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 really about serving the community and making sure Jackson County uh, has a fair shake in things that are happening around uh, the community. And so, uh, with that being said, you know, I have four children: two boys, two girls. Uh, all of them in the Kansas City, Missouri School District, um, as well as, you know, you know, ser serving serving in, you know for the jackson county legislator is is definitely something that i think is necessary and is needed uh with all my experience education uh skills and talent uh i've been uh an entrepreneur i still am an entrepreneur actually uh, as well as uh work in corporate uh for many years um and with that being said i have skills in both that are clearly uh you know clearly you know, makes me competent to do the job, to perform the job. And so with that being said, I've worked with budgets of, of you know, uh, $1.5 million in terms of allocating, staying, keeping budgets in line, things of that nature. Uh, personally, uh, I've generated over $2 million in tourism money uh, for this Kansas City community. Uh, and that's just drawing in folks from other places as well as uh, generating income for Kansas City in, in, the, in the general uh, Jackson County area. And so with that being said, uh, I have I have the experience. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well said. Okay, Mr. Murphy. Unmute. Got it. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for hosting this, uh, this forum. This is great for the voters to get up to hear what, uh, uh, what candidates have to say. It's a great educational event. Uh, again, thank you very much to the league. Um, my reason for running is I've never run for anything before. I've been very active in my community with my homes association. Uh, I've been active with, with certain issues within the city. And over the years on the homes association, I've seen, say in the last 20 years, uh, great problems arise on the assessed value of homes and the taxing, of, the taxing on that assessed values. The principal thing that the county does is set your assessment values and tax you on it. I'm very concerned about what's going on, the, on the, in the county. There doesn't seem to be much transparency. I want to dig in and get into those numbers. I want to protect seniors who, who may be facing uh, foreclosure on their homes because they can't pay their taxes. We are in a hyperinflationary period. Home values have shot up, but incomes haven't. Many people are on fixed incomes, uh, particularly the retirees. I want to make sure that they're, uh, that they're, that they're safeguarded in addition I want to make sure that families are safeguarded, that they're not they're able to afford the homes they live in and stay in them. And I've I've worked on uh, I've worked on Wall Street, I've worked in finance, I've uh, volunteered, I've been on uh, uh, on on boards that has I hash, handle large sums of money, so I do have a background in finance. Thank, Thank you, you, Mr. Murphy. Yes, and in fact, Mr. Murphy, we're going to start with you again in this random order. Mm -hmm or start with you this time. This is the question. Please describe at least two county problems that you are most concerned about. Starting with uh, Mr. Well, Murphy. I hate to go back and, and, and re-echo re, uh, re it, but the, uh, the biggest problem I foresee is the uh, property taxes that, that, are, that are coming along. We're hearing that uh, the county's hired a outside consulting firm out of Ohio to do assessments. Uh, they've staffed up rather heavily in the assessments department to do in-home assessments. That's not there to lower taxes. We know that uh, with inflation, people's homes, home values have increased. 
What I want to do is make sure that there is a cap on their ability to increase your property tax. That's one. Second biggest thing is they're going to be embarking on a $350 million detention center. Not much, not much news uh, has come out about that. Not much information. It seems to be one of these murky gray areas that you'll find out after all the money's been spent. Uh, whatever money they thought they were going to spend, it's going to be a lot more now. There's, there's supply, uh, supply issues, there's uh, inflation, there's lack of people who can work. I am very concerned what that's going to cost. And at some point, they'll build one. Well, there's a building downtown. It's not, in the, uh, it's not that old, and it's in terrible, terrible repair, the, the original detention center. What type of maintenance budget are they going to uh, 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 place on the uh, place in with? Uh, what type of maintenance will they be doing on the new facility? Because in the last facility, they did no maintenance. This is why they're in the state they're in. So whatever thing they want to buy, they need to take care of. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Sudet. Yeah, same here. I'm going to echo what John just said. Uh, without a doubt, you know, the, the property tax assessment is the biggest issue uh, facing the legislator. I mean, we've got lawsuits. I mean, there was over 21,000 uh, uh, appeals on the uh, assessments, and which is which is a record for the country. And so uh, with that being said, that is uh, one of the biggest things that we have to take a look at. And from what I'm hearing, they, they, they've, like you said, he said they've had an outside consulting firm, which is costing $17 million. I think they originally budgeted $3 million for this, but now it's costing $17 million, which is totally out of line. So I don't understand this. And so these are some of the things that I'll be diving into and dissecting, and I'll be sharing this information with the public. So I'm not, I'm not one to just keep it in the, in the legislative chambers. I'm the guy who's going to let the public know, hey, this is what's happening. This is how your tax dollars are being spent. You need, to make, you need to let us know what steps you need want us to take and we'll make the best decisions possible. Um, second thing is, same thing, the county jail. Um, even with that, we have lawsuits, inmates uh, uh, suing the county uh, just because of, uh, of incidents that happened. Uh, you have inmates who have broken through walls and harmed or even killed other inmates uh, in that sense. And this has been an issue that's been looming for years. Even, even before Frank White came in, this has been an issue for the county, and I've talked to police officers about this, and they say we definitely need a new jail. Uh, I'm hearing that uh, the city and the county is talking together in regards to uh, coming together and trying to put together a Thank plan you. to build Thank it together. You. Thank you very much. Ms. Payton. Thank you. Um, the first thing that I'm going to talk about as well is tax assessments. We need to have more tax programs. Our seniors that are 65 plus can make their payments now quarterly, and that is a great help to them. But what about others that are on fixed income or those that are disabled? I will promote programs where it will make tax payments. Well, they can make tax payments instead of one lump sum payment. It's also a concern that we add employees to that department. The, the department has made great strides. Um, this year, our personal property tax was easier to pay, but we need to, of course, have more people hired. I've seen a commercial running now looking for assessors, assessors and I appreciate that. But at the same time, I want to be sure that we get in front of the 2023 assessment and be very transparent in talking to our residents, making sure that they are aware, especially those that are in areas of gentrification. Um, and also, I want there to be an appeal process that is more user friendly. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay, third question, candidates. Are there any Jackson County departments that need diversity attention? And if so, which ones come to mind? And we're gonna start with Ms. Sudeth. Uh, so to answer I'm sorry, that, I'm sorry, with Mr. Sudeth. No, it's, it's quite all right, it's quite all right. Uh, uh, I'm gonna answer that question by saying, uh, I'm sure there, there is some attention that needs to be placed in uh, some of the departments to figure out uh, are we are there minorities 
um, you know, uh, there, 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 there's nothing, you know, where we're discriminating against folks in terms of working in all the different departments. And so with that being said, I mean, there's a thing called a uh, disparate impact rule. We need to have a certain percentage of people who, uh, of the population that represent that population working in different places, you know, in, in those different departments. And so with that being said, it's something we have to take a look at. I mean, right offhand, I wouldn't know that number or if there's even an issue with that, but that would some, be something I would take a look at. If, it, if there's anything that's disparities in terms of uh, uh, folks who are not being represented in, in certain departments, then we would have to definitely put a focus on that. Thank you. Ms. Payton. Well, first of all, the Jackson County legislator um, may see five new legislators in November. And that will certainly serve to diversify the Jackson County legislature. In regards to individual departments, I know um, that Frank White has been a proponent of pro promoting diversity in his department. I know of two black females um, that are heads of departments currently. And I agree with Mr. Sudup. The makeup of our Jackson County legislator of our departments in Jackson County need to look like the community that we serve. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Murphy. Thank you. Uh, I am unaware of any lack of diversity in departments. Uh, considering we have a man of color uh, who's county executive, I would say that also the sheriff is a, also a person of color. I'd find it irregular that they, they are not um, uh, invested in making sure that these departments look like the people they serve. I would wanna make sure that everyone in these departments are competent and able to do the job and bringing people the best value for their buck across the board. And I will look at any, any disparity uh, in any department and make sure it does reflect the people that they do serve in ideals and in background. Thank you. Thank you. Next question, candidates. Would you support ranked choice voting in Jackson County? And if so, would you vote for it, fund it, and implement it? And we're going to start with Ms. Payton. My experience and knowledge about um, that type of voting is very limited. It became an issue in the New York election, and I do follow politics. Um, so while I don't completely understand it, it seems like a process that is a very long process that uh, does actually give voters opportunities that they may not have with a single ballot. From what I know, again, which is very limited, I would not at this time support that type of voting. I would need to research more and know more about it. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Murphy. I uh, would not support it. I would not fund it. I don't like ranked choice voting. I think it's very confusing. I think you end up with fringe parties and fringe candidates. You look at uh, countries in Europe that do have it. I think Italy does have it. I think that uh, Germany had a version of that in the 1930s that gave a fringe party a lot more power than it should have had. Uh, that was proportional representation, kind of a, a play on that. So I would not support it. I think that uh, we have a great primary process and uh, people can step up and stand for election and use forums like this to get their message out and heard. They just got to show up to these forums. Um, so no, I would not support it. Thank you. Next Mr. Sudeth. Um, I'm going to echo what the other two candidates have said. Yeah, uh, personally, I wouldn't support it either. Uh, like, like John just said, it's, it's really kind of confusing. And uh, I think the process we have right now is, is probably one of the best processes um, uh, that any country could have. And so with that being said, um, uh, I wouldn't support it. Thank you. Next question. Do you believe that Jackson County property taxes are fairly assessed now? 
And if not, how would you make tax assessments more fair and equitable while still maintaining funding for the Jackson County services? And we're gonna start with Mr. Murphy. Thank you. Uh, my understanding is Jackson County had a surplus last year, 27, $28 million. Uh, I didn't get my rebate check in the mail. I don't know if any of the candidates did. I, maybe they didn't send them out. But Jackson County seems to be fairly well funded. What I do see is people struggling. I see people struggling to pay tuition bills. I see people struggling to pay mortgage bills. I see people struggling uh, to pay grocery bills and afford meat and vegetables and fresh vegetables for their kids. I need to make sure, we need to make sure that the assessments are fair, but they're also realistic. If you have a 40% increase in the value of property this year, and the county wants you to pay that, that's gonna be a problem. It's gonna be a problem for a lot of people. The only guy that actually can sit there and actually put, and say the assessments are, are not good or they're too high is Frank White. And over the last you know, 15 years, neither he or Mike Sanders would do something like that. So uh, what I wanna do is put a cap on them for retirees and for everyone else. The year you retire, you lock in, you go to the courthouse, you lock in your rate, and that's your rate to leave that property one way or another. For everyone else, a 5% cap every assessment period. That way, if your property does go up 40% 40, 40 in value, you've got 16 years to figure it out. Families need to be taken care of in this county. The county government is doing pretty well. Thank you very much. Thank you. Mr. Sudis. Yeah, can you repeat the question one more time? I just want to make sure, sure. I answer Do you answer. believe that Jackson County property taxes are fairly assessed right now? If not, how would you make property tax assessments more fair and equitable while maintaining funding for Jackson County services? So to answer the question, no, I don't think they're fair. And that was obvious on what happened here um, recently in the last three, two to three years. Um, with some people's property taxes doubling, in some cases tripling. Um, from my understanding, um, of course, we have a lack, a lack of assessors, and so that's, that's contributing to the problem. But for the most part, you know, when it, when it comes to the uh, assessments, they're not fair across the board. You know, uh, Easter Truce, you had, uh, you know, once again, these property taxes doubled, uh, which says to me, something has happened here. Um, they did that, and still there's no investment in the community at the same time. And so I'm going to say property taxes, are not, they're not fair. What I would do in order to uh, look at fixing that problem is look at some, something where we can do a graduated or graduated rate, um, you know, whether it's 3%, 5% a year. Yeah, maybe put the cap on it, but we have to take a look at the whole and, and its totality in terms of of what's happening, but we cannot. That's simply just something that was ridiculous. I don't even know how we, the, the county even got away with uh, these assessments and uh, it doesn't make sense. So, but we, I, I would put up some kind of plan together where if it did, the property taxes did increase as such, then um, would make it a graduated rate to where you wouldn't be paying all that money all at once, um, something of that nature, so. Thank you. Ms. Payton. Thank you. We are where we are with tax assessments because there was not a steady level of increase. So I am definitely a proponent of a steady level of increase. People have made great investments in their home and they are to be considered as an investment not only for them personally, but for our, all of our communities. Um, and the, those assessments help fund our public schools, our libraries, the metropolitan community college, they fund so much. So assessments are necessary. Um, I do agree that we shouldn't stockpile. And I personally am a proponent of collaboration not only collaborating with residents on a solution, but also looking to see what works in other areas. Tax assessment is not unique to Jackson County. So how can we look at other models and how can we become better as, uh, as Jackson County in regards to tax assessment? It can be done. 
And because this is such a grave con uh, a concern for myself and Jackson County residents, it is something that needs immediate attention. Thank you. Thank you. The next question. Do you support county sheriff, the county sheriff department working with federal law enforcement laws? Do you support new or different gun regulations for Jackson County? So there's two questions embedded here. Do you support the sheriff department working with federal law enforcement laws? And two, do you support new or different gun regulations for Jackson County? We'll begin with Mr. Sudeth. The, the quick answer to that is yes and yes, um, but I'm going to elongate it for you. Uh, Sheriff Forte is a good friend of mine. Uh, we've, we've had some conversations uh, uh, about different things, but having that support on a federal level and, and them working together, absolutely. It just makes for a better, uh, a better system. And so with that being said, the answer to that is yes. As far as gun laws, and I hate to say it this way, but hell yes, we need stiffer gun laws, uh, stiffer penalties. Um, and, and not only that, we, we need to make it to where uh, folks are not able to buy guns so quickly. You know, uh, there needs to be some things, uh, something put in place to keep folks from being able to purchase guns, you know, with the waiting periods, things of that nature. Uh, it, 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 and, and especially for, for folks who have mental health issues, uh, they should not be able to purchase a gun if you have a mental health issue. And so, uh, there, I mean, there's a host of things that we could talk about in regards to that, even going down to domestic violence issues. But gun laws, yes, we need stiffer gun laws. We, we, we see what's happening around the country. These, these shootings are happening on a weekly basis. Weekly, monthly basis, we hear about mass shootings. And, so, and it's all dealing with people sometimes who have mental issues and some, pe some people just, you know, have issues, period. But with different gun laws, I think it would set a precedent and people will start paying attention and making it difficult for these folks to buy these, purchase these guns. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Payton. Thank you. Um, yes, um, to the first part of that question. And I um, firmly believe that Mr. As I said, I am a proponent of collaboration. So the answer is yes to um, the federal part of that question. And in regards to gun regulation, we know that our state government is um, pro guns. So what we can do as a county, because we can't change those laws, but we can strive for screening we need better screening mental health issues is one is the second concern i have in, in regards to uh, where we need to start or where we need to look for resolutions in jackson county so we need to have better screening um, i'm very aware of the great work that gene peters baker and combat are doing and i am a proponent of um, what she is doing in combat and a proponent of a gun buyback program. I think we really need a gun buyback program. And um, we need to look more at organizations such as Ad Hoc and the work that combat is doing to um, reduce gun violence. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Mr. Murphy. Yes. I, I, I'm a proponent of uh, the sheriff's deputies and sheriff's office to be working with federal law enforcement. That's a force multiplier. We've got a lot of crime and a lot of issues in the city and around this county. And a lot of them are uh, multi-state and almost international with fentanyl and drugs coming in from our, our open, pretty much our open southern border. Uh, anything that they can, we can, we can get to any, any federal assistance that we can get to help us with crime and, and working together is a blessing. Because uh, our officers are overtaxed, the police department here in Kansas City is overtaxed, and we need to get these bad guys away from our, our families and our kids uh, and get them off the streets. In terms of guns, um, our states, uh, our state uh, ha has a big say in what what that is. We have very little what we can do here in the county. I would like to propose that uh, 
getting guns away from anybody who's a criminal, making sure that they ever touch a gun again, they're in jail for a long time. Anybody committing a crime with a gun is going to go to jail for a long time. That should get that should get it away, get get the keep it out of the uh, the hands of a lot of a lot of bad folks. And like I said, that we we can be we can be working with the federal government, working with the state authorities to get these bad guys off the street. And I have no problem with the sheriff's department working on it. Thank you. Thank you. Next question. What is your position regarding moving the Royal Stadium downtown? If you support the move, what would the public financing of the public-private partnership be? So we'll start this with Ms. Payton. Thank you. 2031, um, the year that the Royals are looking at perhaps moving. From talking to residents, going door to door, many are opposed to um, the Royal Stadium moving downtown. It would require, as the person who submitted the question, and it may require and probably will require public and taxpayer partnerships to make it happen. Um, we, of course, don't want to initiate any taxes to get this done. Uh, in talking to residents, ideas have emerged to uh, keep it where it is because of where it's located in Jackson County and to initiate incentives perhaps that would help build up that area and increase opportunity in that area and be desirable to having the Royal stay in that part of Jackson County. Um, there has been talk that the Royals are determined to move. I don't know that personally. I can only share with you what my resident, what the residents have shared with me. Um, but if we do come to a point as a board, and I am one member of the board, the legislators, if it does come to that, I will definitely promote non-taxpayer funds be used. Thank you. Mr. Murphy. It, uh, if the Royals want to move downtown, best of luck to them. I think we got a great facility where we are. Uh, I think that it's a beautiful stadium. I grew up in New York. I, 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 I came here on a three-year plan. 22 years later, we're still here. I can't tell you how many people I brought to that stadium, and they can't believe what a beautiful place it is, how easy it is to get there, and how easy it is to get out of it. Uh, that being said, I'm going door to door. I'm an at-large candidate, which means it's the entire county, and I'm knocking on a lot of doors and talking to a lot of people. There isn't a big appetite for a big tax increase to build a stadium downtown. That's what I'm hearing. Now, that may change in two years if they, they put that before the people, because it, it'll have to go before the people for a vote. I don't know where the money's coming from. I just don't know. I mean, I, I think we should be working with the Royals and the Chiefs about getting them to stay there and uh, it is a great facility. So, like I said, if they wanna move downtown, the best of luck to them. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Sudis. Yeah, I'm gonna say, you know, one way or another, something's gonna happen here. And the fact of the matter is, is that like John said, uh, like Donna said, um, we have a great facility out there right now. Um, it, and, and to move it downtown um, is probably going to take some taxpayer dollars to do it. And so, and that's just not sugarcoating it or anything of that nature. Uh, I heard John, John Sherman say that he's going to have heavy private investment fund and public funds uh, to try to make it happen. Um, and, and I'm not shooting it down. If, if it can work in, uh, work in the sense that it doesn't hurt the taxpayers, the community, then yeah, let's do it. But if, if it's gonna be a heavy strain on the community, then I say, let's not do that. Uh, let's keep it where it's at, you know, the stadium where it's at. Uh, we have a wonderful stadium, it's right off the highway, easy access, easy entry, um, without a doubt. So I can't go, I can't say one way or another whether I would be for it right now or not. I would, I would actually do research on other uh, cities to find out what they've done and, and the amounts of money that's come from it, you know, uh, the income that they've generated from it, things of that nature. And so without, you know, shooting it down right away, I would take a look at it. But 
once again, if it's a heavy burden on the people, uh, it's something that I would, I would definitely be against. Thank you. Next question. And I think we'll have time for only one or two more. What would you use for you use for guidance on county health decisions? The public health director, federal health guidelines, science, or something else? Please explain. And now that COVID cases are increasing, would you follow that guidance to return, if it required, to return to mask mandates? We will start this with Mr. Murphy. Thank you. I would, in terms of uh, research, in terms of guidance, I would use all of the above. I'd also use the doctors I know in my community that I've used and talk to them. I'm, uh, fortunately or unfortunately, over the number of years, I've got to know a number of doctors fairly well. Uh, but that being said, I trust them very much. So I would use their advice. I, I, I think we need to be very careful about going back to the masks masking up and shutting down economies and locking people in their homes. I think that had a very detrimental effect on our nation. I think it's contributed to a lot of mental illness, loneliness, and has, and has helped destroy our economy. So uh, for COVID, I don't see that coming back in, 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 uh, in a great way. And I, 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 I question, I question, you know, were the masks, what, 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 did the masks really help? Did locking everything down really help? I don't know. I, you know, I, I'm, I'm leaning towards, I don't think it did. I, I, I don't think it, and, and unfortunately our, our health system now is completely politicized. It, it's terrible. I would, uh, as I said, I would just, I would basically do my own research. I would talk to the doctors I trust, and I would talk to the federal and local health officials I trust. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Sudeth. Yeah, I, I would, uh, I would personally, I would rely on the the health director here. I would rely, I would, I would yield to, I would yield to the health health director here. But I would rely on the information from from abroad, with all you know, uh, from a federal level, level, state level, and from the city level. But I would, uh, I would yield and to to the information that's happening here on the ground because he's going to have a better perspective of what's happening. He knows the numbers that are happening in our city, and so with that being said. Uh, I would say the, the director here is who I, I would yield to on that. As far as the mass mandate coming back, I mean, if, 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 this, if this pops back up again, COVID-19 pops up again, we may have to literally do that. Uh, and I'll tell you right now, I, I, I caught COVID because I didn't have a mask. I was 12 feet, I was actually probably 20 feet away from a person. That person sneezed in the room when I asked them did they have COVID, they said, no, it's just my allergies. Sneezed twice and I asked the same questions. No, it's just my allergies. And then next thing I know, I get a call from my brother three days later and say, hey, man, you okay? Yeah, well, I'm okay. Are you okay? He said, yeah, well, such and such had caught COVID. And so I'm feeling bad. And so I'm just giving you the story. But with that being said, I ended up catching COVID. The very next day, I was down for three days. And so um, I believe COVID was real. Uh, I know people who passed away from COVID. And if it came to it, I, we may have to have those mass mandates. Uh, if, if the public health director says, hey, this is what's necessary, then we need to abide by all the rules and regulations, so. Thank you, thank you. Ms. Payton. Thank you. I view the uh, resources and sources that you mentioned as reputable sources. And I would yield to what they say in making my decision, my personal decision and my decision as a legislator. I am honored to have been elected for the Raytown School Board where I currently serve. And I know what the shut in and the mask have done in regards to education. However, first and foremost, I know people that have died from COVID. So first and foremost, safety and health are what matters the most. Right now, we don't have a mask mandate. I don't foresee one in the near future. COVID is literally becoming what appears to be something that is going to be long-term that we live with, that we live through, and that we work together to keep our souls and others safe. 
Again, I know what the shutdowns did to the school district. I know how our students are recovering. Some flourished, some are still recovering. Um, so just initiating a mandate without correct information, no, I would not, but with the information as it was that we needed, then we needed to survive as a whole community. Thank you. I think this may be our last question. Historically, county government has been viewed as a place for which people run for office in order to get their friends and relatives county contracts. How might this kind of nepotism be prevented? And what would you do in order to hold county officials, including yourself and fellow legislators, accountable and ethical? We'll start with Mr. Sudeth. Yeah, it's simple. Just create some type of policy that, that uh, forbids uh, legislators from uh, hiring you know, their families, just that simple, uh, to do jobs or, or uh, you know, positioning for jobs uh, dealing with county government. Uh, that would be the best way that I could say that. If, 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 if it's that much of, uh, of uh, a nuisance and, and corruption going on, uh, with contracts being shifted around to each other or nepotism in that, in that sense, then just create a, a, a policy that forbids that to happen, you know? Um, and that would be my answer. Okay. Ms. Payton. As a legislator, I will be serving all the residents of Jackson County. So it is important that we all serve with integrity and that nepotism or even our personal businesses do not get in the way of what is important in regards to contracts. Um, I would like to see the contract process be at least two to three weeks for review. Right now I, in attending um, meetings, I don't see that happening. Um, I'd like for committees that are doing reviews on contracts to be open and upfront and letting, making sure that the entire legislature and our residents have the transparency they need to guarantee that nepotism is not happening. And we do need standards. We need standards set for the legislator so it won't happen so that we can avoid it. We are servants and we need to always keep that in mind. We need to also be sure that we understand that the lowest bid is not always the best bid. When we're awarding contracts, we need to be cognizant of minority women and disadvantaged businesses. And we need to make sure that all contracts for work are done by a company that pays the prevailing wage. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Murphy. Thank you. <clears throat> uh, I, would, I would have, I, I insist on a, the, there be a zero tolerance, no nepotism policy, period. Uh, there needs to be tran better transparency down that courthouse about who's getting what, who's the makeup of this company, and how, is, and, and how and if, if anyone is related to anyone on the county legislature or county exec's office. Need to make sure the people you're dealing with uh, have, have, have the county's best interest, not um, an insider's best interest. So uh, again, we need transparent, better transparency down there, no nepotism, and basically maybe a, maybe a jail sentence for somebody who, who violates that. Uh, the, the county, as you said, historically has been the, uh, I call it the Tom Prendergast Memorial Courthouse. I mean, that's how Tom feathered his nest, was basically nepotism contracts with, with, his, uh, with his construction company. So we need to make sure that, that doesn't go on, that that doesn't happen again, and every contract sees the light of day and everybody knows who's bidding on what. And that's it. Okay, thank you. Candidates, it's time for your two minute closing remarks. Take a moment to gather your thoughts. Thank you, audience for your thought provoking questions and your interest in this election. Remember this forum will be archived on the league's website 
lwvkc.org. That's League of Women Voters KC.org, lwvkc.org. Now for the closing remarks, which will be two minutes, and we will start with Ms. Payton. Thank you. John Lewis said, the vote is precious and your vote is precious to me. I am a continual learner, an empathetic listener, a servant leader, and I pledge to be an advocate for all of Jackson County. I'm very thankful for those individuals and organizations that are in support of me, Firefighters Local 42, International Brotherhood of Electrical Workers Local 124, Freedom Incorporated, Southland Progress, the incumbent, uh, excuse me, uh, Crystal Williams, who is leaving the seat that I am seeking, Alvin Brooks, mayor, former mayor pro tem, Pastor Modest Miles from Morning Star Baptist Church, Pastor John Brooks from Macedonia Baptist Church, my treasurer, Stephanie Burton, and my campaign consultant, Mike Harden. My voice will be your voice. My voice will be informed and inclusive. I will study to show that I um, understand, to be sure that I understand everything um, that comes before us, that my vote will be an informed vote and that I will lead and work in transparency. I will work to make sure that you, the community has more access to our meetings and more access to providing your input. I want to earn your vote. And I do ask that you vote Donna Payton, Jackson County Legislature, second district at large. And please vote August 2nd. It is so important that we get the vote out for this primary. Thank you so much for taking the time. Thank you for your interest and have a wonderful evening. Also, I'm sorry, I'd love to thank the League of Women Voters for putting this on. Thank you. And Mr. Murphy is next. Thank you very much. And again, thank you very much for hosting this forum. Uh, as I said earlier, I've never run for office before. I've served in the community as a volunteer. I've been involved in my homes association. Uh, when I'm elected, I'll, I'll be an advocate for all, all of the entire county. That's an, what an at-large does. Uh, I'm, and uh, I wanna make sure that there's transparency down at the courthouse and everyone gets a fair shake. I'm very concerned about the uh, impending property tax increases. I wanna protect uh, Kansas City families. I keep hearing stuff about who's going to fund the county. I'm wondering who's going to fund the, the families in this city. I want to protect the most endangered species out there, which that of the Kansas City family. And, and uh, what I'll do is I'll be an advocate, a voice for the people. I will work tirelessly, tire, tirelessly to advocate on their behalf. Uh, please vote for me August 2nd. Thank you very much. Thank you. Mr. Sudeth. First, I want to say thank you guys, the League of Women Voters, for having us, for having this forum, uh, for giving us this platform to, to show who we are uh, as candidates. Um, and with that being said, uh, transparency is, is one of the biggest things for me uh, in regards to what's happening downtown right now. We've talked about quite a few things. Um, tax assessments is, is so huge right now. Um, and, and the fact that, that some of the legislators let this happen uh, Easter truce and uh, these assessments doubled and tripled on the, some of the most poor, some of the poorest communities and disenfranchised folks in the city. Um, it, it just shows we need people in the office that care. I'm one of those persons that care. Uh, 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 in the last couple of years, I, I've been um, uh, working with with uh, protest groups, uh, basically, you know, helping these guys get on target in terms of you know changing policies. And, and legislation dealing with uh, police contracts uh, with the city. Uh, in doing so, uh, they had to bring them out of the street. Hey, these are the things you need to be looking at. These are things you need to be focused on. And so with that being said, uh, I have a passion for the people, I have a passion for the city. 
uh, I am asking for your vote on August 2nd. My name is Mitchell Sutter, and I look to see you at the polls. Thank you. And thank you, candidates, for your willingness to participate in this forum. Remember, a recording of this forum will be available soon on the League website. Audience, please take time to share the insight you have gained tonight with your family and friends and be sure to go to the polls and vote on Tuesday, August 2nd. Thank you and good night.